Amen. Father God, we thank you. Father God, we thank you for this day. Father God, we thank you, Father God, for another opportunity, Father God, to sit at your table, Father God, and be fed by your word, oh God. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus, Almighty God, that you forgive us all sins we may have committed. Father God, be there, things we said, things we've done, things that we did not do, oh God, that you told us to do. We repent of that right now, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And that means that we turn from those sins that we've committed and to not do them again, oh God. And Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you'll have your way in and through this teaching tonight, oh God. Continue to reveal yourself to us, oh God. That's our desire, to know you, Father. We want to see you, oh God. And Father God, we pray, Father God, that you allow us to see ourselves, who we are in your word and who we are in you, in Jesus Christ, oh God. And Father God, I pray that I decrease and that you will increase, oh God. And we thank you right now for what you're doing, Father God, in us collectively and individually. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, right now... We're going to go ahead. Uh, we stopped in chapter 40. And um, I think it was, uh, I stopped at verse, I'm going to start at 11. So we're going to go to chapter 40 and we're going to start at verse 11. Even though I think I um, stopped at 14. I want to back up a little bit. And the title of my chapter calls this the comfort for, comfort for God's people. Isaiah is speaking words of comfort by the, um, by the most high as words of comfort to his people. Amen. And starting at verse 11, it reads, he will feed his flock like a shepherd and he will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. And I want to read um, Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34, verse 11 to 14. And it reads, For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I will bring them back home to their own land of Israel from among the peoples and the nations. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and by the rivers and in all the places where they live. Well, right now, this very place is in the news. And the Most High said, when he bring them back, when he brings them back, okay, he said, he's the one who's going to be taken care of. Amen. So it's amazing that right now, this is, this is the very place that's in the news today. Amen. Verse 12. Uh, let's stay right here. I want to go to let, read Ezekiel 23. 3423. And like I said, you can write these down. Ezekiel 24, I mean, I'm sorry, 34, verse 23. And it reads, And I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them and be a shepherd to them. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be a prince among my people. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 31, you are my flock, the sheep of my pasture. You are my people and I am your God. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. Amen. Back to Isaiah 40, <clears throat> verse uh, 13. I'm sorry, uh, verse 12. And it reads, who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? 
uh, right here, I'm going to read Isaiah 48, 13. Isaiah 48, 13. And it reads, it was my hand that laid the foundations of the earth, my right hand that spread out the heavens above. When I call out the stars, they all appear in order. <laughs> Amen. Verse 13, who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instructions about what is good? I want to go to Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, 34. And it reads, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory, all glory to him forever, amen. And then I have right, let me see uh, another one here. I've got, um, let's see, I need my pencil. Don't keep up. First Corinthians. Let's go to first Corinthians, you can write this down. First Corinthians two. First Corinthians chapter two, 16. And it reads, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things for we have the mind of Christ. So those without the mind of Christ, to them, this is, well, as the word say, foolishness. Amen. Verse 14, has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Does someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. Verse 16, all the wood in Lebanon's forest and all Lebanon's, am, Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes, they count for less than nothing, more em mere emptiness and fraud. Uh, let's go to Isaiah, what was that, 17? Isaiah 29, go back to Isaiah 29 and 7, because this references that. Isaiah 29, verse 7 reads, all the nations fighting against Jerusalem will vanish like a dream, and those who are attacking her walls will vanish like a vision in the night. Amen. Verse 18, back to Isaiah 40, verse 18. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I want to read Micah 7. I think that's what it is. I think it's Micah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Micah. Yeah, Micah. Micah chapter 7, 18. Micah 7, 18 reads... Where's another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant <clears throat> overlooking, overlooking the sins of his special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever 
because you delight in showing unfailing love. Amen. <clears throat> and I want to read Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, verse 5. And it reads, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Some people pull out their silver and gold and hire craftsmen to make a God from it. Then they bow down and they worship it. They carry it around on their shoulders. And when they set it down, it stays there. It can't even move. And when someone prays to it, there's no answer. It can't rescue anyone from trouble. Verse eight, so, don't, so do not forget this. Keep it in mind. Remember this, okay? And it says you guilty ones. But um, <laughs> it's amazing that these very same gods and these idols, we still see them today. They worship in the same ones. Like, like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun because every one of us, you know, especially us, us ladies who go into these nail shops, you see these little Buddhas sitting up there with this dried up fruit in front of them. And every now and then, it depends on how often you go back, you'll see fresh fruit in, sitting there in front of them. And I have, uh, but the, I just keep my mouth shut because I'll be one. I be wanting to know, okay, if Buddha haven't ate it yet, or if he haven't moved, what are you waiting on in, after all this time, really? I mean, what is this really all about? What is it really all about? Buddha haven't moved one time. And it reminded me also of the incident that, that the um, big tsunami, that very first one in Sri Lanka, <clears throat> and one of the things that I saw that I, even out of all the devastation that there was, I, I, the, one of the things that were, was on the news that really stood out to me, it was this huge Buddha. I mean, it was huge. And it was sitting there on the beach, but it was turned over on its side. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, Wow, do they expect Buddha to get up and sit himself back up on the top? You know, big Buddha is there, but that's what they're praying to, and that's what they're believing on. And it is just really, I was just, it was mind boggling to me. But Buddha couldn't even get up. And I was wondering, like, do they think about that? So, what is it really? All? I mean, did anybody else want to comment on that? Their thoughts? Because this is what the most high is. You know, he's saying he's, he is God. There is none other. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He said, you, you can't, what, what can you compare to me? What image would you make of me? You, you know, is this, you know, there's nothing on earth that we can create that even compares to him. And this is one of the biggest things that he really dealt with. Um, um, the, Hebrews, when they came out of Egypt, it, you know, as it concerned idols and idol worship, amen, as he was making himself known to them. Does anybody want to comment on that before I move on? Nobody? Well, Sister Syria, I, I could write, raise my hand. Okay. Hope y'all can hear me. Yes. But it, as you were speaking, I thought about even the children of Israel after they were delivered from Egypt. When they got to a situation where they didn't feel God was doing what they wanted, mm -hmm. or they didn't feel that they would had access to leadership because Moses was away, they went right back to what was familiar. It went right back to that idolatry. And I, I think what some people can do, and we can do it not so much sub subconsciously out of habit, is to worship idols because they don't do enough to trust God fully. Yes. They'll go to church, they'll go through the religious motions, do all the religious ordinance, but when it comes down to really understand that God is spirit, as Elder Jones, and that was profound, yes. that God is spirit and yes. we have to approach him as a spiritual <laughs> being and trust that, trust what we can't see, it is, it's mind boggling. Now, some people, they have to see it. They have to have some physical representation 
before they can uh, seem like have confidence. That's that's my view. That's the only reason for it. Because you know they this cast that bring you out of Egypt, but yet you're willing to worship it now. You see how Amen. ridiculous that if you think about it? And often they don't be thinking about what you're doing. Amen. That, that's my take. That, that's all we have to explain. They don't think. And it's so weird though, because there was there was no result to the dead thing, to their prayers to this dead thing. There was nothing. I mean, they prayed to it, but it was nothing happening. But they kept, but that's where they kept presenting their prayers. And that's what they were putting their trust in, even though nothing was coming out of that or being gained out of that. Whereas, you know, the most high was making himself known. You could see him as a fire by night and that cloud by day. And he provided food and water from the rock and all the miracles and things that he performed, even bringing them out of Israel, you know, out of Egypt, all these things that he done. But all those years, them praying to, the, praying to them sticks, stones, rocks, all that stuff, They nothing ever came out of that. You understand what I'm saying? Nothing transpired from that. But they could see the true and then God moved. They literally did. You, you, you know, Sister Sylvia, actually, uh, people, even uh, I can even think back to myself, that when you, when you uh, make something, you build something or, or you buy something like a car, and every Saturday you out there polishing it, <laughs> putting armor oil on the tires, I mean, you 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 you're actually putting your heart in it. You don't even want a spot to be on it after you finished cleaning it up, you know. And you don't you don't want nobody to splash it. So I mean, when you put your heart into it, that's that's when it becomes an idol to you, because because you think you have created a masterpiece of, of something, you know, and and these people, when they built these Buddhas and these statues back in the day, they thought they were creating a masterpiece, you know? And they, they just put their heart in it and ends up worshiping a pile of junk, you know? And that, that's just the way I see it. Amen. They did back then, yes. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something, too. And this is from my experience and some things God taught me. You know, uh, be, before I gave my life to the Lord, before, you know, and um, coming back to the Lord, because when I first got saved, I was, what, 19 or 20 years old. But um, and when I came back to the Lord, but between that time, you know, I had, I mean, I dabbled in witchcraft, I dabbled in tarot cards, I dabbled in, um, uh, what is it, astrology. And them, those different things. And I was very deep in those things. I'd gotten really deep into that. And I remember when I came back to the Lord and um, the most high told me I would, I had did, I had to repent of those things. But one thing I learned, the enemy has a right to cling to anything that belongs to him. And I remember the most high telling me that it's like, and he could, to me, cause I used to like to watch scary movies. And I still sometimes do like the old black and white ones and uh, Dracula and the Wolfman and stuff like that. And um, it, and he compared it to me in my mind because this, this is how he showed it to me. He said, the enemy can only come in if you invite him, just like Dracula. Dracula could not come in to your home unless you invited him. So these spirits, and I believe it was the same with some of these idols now because these spirits, do cleave and they cling to these things. And maybe they were kind of showing them stuff or doing things, or maybe they could see stuff from them. But um, I could, I remember when I got delivered, I could see things. I remember them, those, those, those masks that we, what they call them, those Mardi Gras masks, you know, the little colorful ones. And I had one of those in the house. And um, Man, I promise you, though, I ain't gonna lie. I used to be sitting there sometime. Now, this is before I got saved, and I promise you, them eyes was moving. Every time I moved, those eyes was moving, okay? Because you know, when you hang them on the wall, it's just black behind, 
okay? And I used to look, <laughs> used to catch me now, because it had these little glass beads on it, on the front, and the light would catch it sometimes, like from the TV or something. And I used to look at it. But I remember when I did, came back to the Lord, and the Lord told me, I was at work one day, and he said, I need you to, he said, go home. The Holy Spirit was talking to me. I was sitting doing Bible study uh, on my lunch break. He said, he showed it to me. He said, that mask that's on your wall, and he was showing me some other things. I said, I need you to go, and you need to take those things down, and you need to get rid of it. And I prom when I came home, that was the one, the first thing, I couldn't wait to do it. I came home real quick, and I pulled it off the wall, and um, i never forget it. It was made out of uh, glass, like a, a plaster of Paris or some or something like that. I hit it seven times with the hammer, and do you know that thing wouldn't break? It was the seventh blow and it shattered and went poof. And I promise you when it broke, and I made sure I got up every shard, every little crumb, everything. I didn't want anything left. But I promise you when it broke, it was like something lifted. You understand what I'm saying? The spirit attached to it lifted. It lifted. So these, we do have to be very mindful of bringing things into our house. And, and be spiritually discerning because I really do, spirits do attach themselves to things. And just like you said, there are things we can love so much and cherish so much, we turn them into idols. It could be our wife, our husband, our children, our job, anything we love more than God. Anything that we love more than the most high. And this is one of the things that Jesus was talking about. He said, you're going to have to forsake all. And, and what he was saying, you can't love anything more than you love me. Anybody disagree with that? Amen. We good? All right. I don't know that word. That must have been for somebody. Don't bring nothing in your house. Be mindful of everything you bring into your house. Amen. Because the enemy have a right to cling to anything that belongs to him. Hallelujah. So you might have some, okay, God won't let me let this go right now. Somebody, you need to be praying and ask the most high, is there anything in your house you need to get out? Because some, it can be poverty. It can, I has, the most high showed me that. It can be constant arguments. It could be things going on and you're not sure why it was causing you've been praying. The most high may be showing you there's something you've brought in you need to get rid of. Amen. All right, we're going to move on from there. Hallelujah. Uh, verse, we stopped at what? Verse 40, 19. Isaiah 40, verse 19. And it reads, can the most high be compared to an idol formed in a mold, overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? Or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay and a skilled craftsman to carve an image that won't fall down. So I guess the wealthy people will use the gold and the silver, but the poor people get wood or stone or something to that effect. Amen. I want to um, read Psalms 115. <clears throat> Psalms 115. Yeah, Psalms 115.4. Psalms 1, put that down, I'm going to lose my place. Psalms 115 verse 4. And it reads, their idols, are, their idols are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak, and eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear, and noses, but cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel, and feet, but cannot walk, and throats, but cannot make a sound. And those who make idols are just like them as are all who trust in them. Amen. Now that's what the words say. <laughs> okay, let's go to Habakkuk. 
um, Habakkuk 2, 18. Habakkuk 2, 18. And it reads, what good is an idol carved by man or a cast image that deceives you? How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God that can't even talk. What sorrow awaits you who say to wooden idols, wake up and save us. To speechless stone images, you say, rise up and teach us. <laughs> Can an idol tell you what to do? They may be overlaid with gold and silver, but they are lifeless inside. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Amen. Hallelujah. We're back to Isaiah and we'll go to verse 21. Have you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God, the words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's what my Bible says. <laughs> it says, God sits above the circle of the earth the circle of the earth, not a sphere, the circle. Let's be clear, those are two different things. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him and he spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. Can I read 21? Um, Okay. He judges the great people of the world and brings them all to nothing. They are they hardly get started and barely taken root when he blows on them and they wither and the wind carries them off like chaff. So I want to read um, Romans 21. Romans. Romans chapter Romans chapter 21. I had this one here for some. Yeah, Rome, I'm sorry, Romans 1. 21. Romans 1. I had this for some reason. I wrote this one down. Romans 1, verse 21. And it says, Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused and claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And, as, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful thing their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. And they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worship and they serve the things that God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Amen. Verse 22. Verse 25, and it reads, no, 23, and he judges the great people of the world, verse 23, and he judges the great people of the world and brings them all to nothing. They hardly get started, barely taking root. And when he blows on them, they wither and the wind carries them off like chaff. Okay, then back to 25. Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah 25. 18. Jeremiah 25, 18. And it reads, I went to Jerusalem and the other towns of Judah and their, and their kings and officials drank from the cup from the day until that. 
Is that right? Jeremiah 25, 18 through 27. Um, no, let's skip that one. I don't know if I wrote that down right. Skip that one. We'll come back to that later. Isaiah 25. <clears throat> to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Look into the heavens. Who, who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each one by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Oh, Jacob, oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Okay, I want to read Isaiah 17, 13. Isaiah 17, 13. Isaiah 17, 13, but though, they, but though they thunder like breakers on a beach, God will silence them and they will run away and they will feel like chaff scattered by the wind, like a tumbleweed whirling before a storm. And I think that one was for, um, yeah, verse 24. Verse 28, have you never heard, have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength they will soar high on wings like eagles and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So teach us Lord to wait. <laughs> Made me think of the song, amen. <laughs> Praise God. I wanna read um, Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four. What? Yeah. Romans four, and that'd be the last one for that chapter. Wait, where am I going? Where am I going? Romans four, verse eight, reads. Yes, what joy for those who record for whose record whose record the Lord had cleared of sin. Now is this blessing only... Why did I write that? Let me see. What was that? It says here. What was that for? 4031. Okay, there were some wings like eagles. Amen. Okay, praise God. Hallelujah. Everybody ready? Y'all ready for the questions? I know everybody did them. Yes? No? <laughs> Chapter 40. So let me ask a question because I noticed when I was going back and I was reviewing um, after I was... Uh, taking care of that situation. Uh, Monique couldn't find that. Um, she was the couple of questions. For those of you who only print the chapter that we're actually working on or studying, if you're trying to find those two questions that um, were missing last week, they were actually, if you print the whole chapter, you'll find they were bumped up to 38. So they were just at the top. But if you're, so in case you're just printing those, just the lesson, that we're learning from or reading from or studying that night, 
that's probably why you couldn't, you didn't see those, but that's where they're located. So I noticed when I was uh, doing that, me and my husband, we were editing and going back and reviewing those, chapter 40. Who actually did the first um, few questions in chapter 40? Did y'all address them? Because I was intending to take those off of you guys. Uh, who did them? Anybody who did the first one, it says, what is suggested in the introduction as a theme of Isaiah chapters 40 through 66? Did anybody answer that? I tried. Hey, Amen. at least you tried. <laughs> I was intended to remove those. Okay. okay. But if you want them just to add to your notes, I'll give you the answer is hope for troubled times. Okay. okay, that's the synopsis, pretty much what is being said right there in chapters 40 through 66. This is, Isaiah is, is encouraging Israel. Amen. So if you want to just put that, was hope for troubled times. Okay. Um, the second question was, according to the introduction, what period of Israel's History do chapters 40 through 66 relate to? Did anybody try to answer that? No, I tell you, it's the Babylonian captivity. It's the Babylonian captivity, um, 690 through 620 BC, just in case you want it for your notes. Amen. And the third question was, how was Isaiah able to speak such words of comfort to people who lived after he died? Like for us, <clears throat> how was he able to speak words of comfort? Because these words bring comfort to us. Yes, we read them, but we can only um, get the understanding of what God is truly meaning by his We can only get understanding, true understanding about what? Got a hand. Amen. Oh, I can't see him. Okay. Whoever, whoever, go ahead. Had the hand up. I'm sorry, Sister Sylvia. That's okay. Go ahead. It's not the question that I'm, I'm asking about, but I wanted to know, um, we're doing the book of Isaiah chapter 40, the questions one through five. Yeah, right now I'm on number three. Um, how does Isaiah describe the in, incomparable greatness of God? Is that what yours say? Yes. I just listen to what I mean, like. What Is that what everybody else is say as well? Yours, what, 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 Sister yes. Lawrence said? Yes. Okay. Let me ask you this. Yes, yeah, that's what mine says. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay, what about, um, go to question number six. Do you have question six? No. No. You don't have question six? Only no. to five. So what's question five? Why is, why is lack of trust in God rebuked? Kind of really, yep. I'm gonna have to go and read this. that. That we printed ours about the right after we finished uh 36. No, yeah, 36. I printed right. it all out, right. So but see, I were... take mine and I type all my questions, my answers in it, and I supersize it. So it, it, I might have thrown some of these off, okay? At least chapter 40, because 40 is not adding up at all. Okay, so you said it was only five questions. Yes. yes. Okay, y'all, let's skip questions number 40. We'll come back to them next week. So let's go to chapter 41. Um, Elder Jones, who hand is up? Is that your hand? It. Why he's here iPad. laughing and rearing back? That was iPad. <laughs> that was that was Sister Lauren. I, I do have a comment though, uh, Sister Sylvia. I beg your pardon. I do have a comment about how we ended in in forty. Okay. How the 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 fact that it's entitled a comfort and, and Isaiah was 
speaking comforting time. And if we look back to 39, you know, the prophets had come to um, King Hezekiah that all the, you know, all the wealth was going to be taken away. So they did go into captivity. And if we apply it to our life, like when we hear prophetic word, we think, okay, this is going to happen. But we have to understand, I mean, this, I, I try to rest like that. There's the whole process. You just can't say this is this, and now I get it instantaneously without going through the process. Right, right. right. That blessing is coming, and God's word is going to manifest and be true, but it's not going to be immediate because the children of Israel had to go through certain processes, certain challenges, the trials and tribulations before. Matter of fact, we haven't got the fullness of it yet because Christ had to come back. Amen. So, so That's when we, correct. and I think that leads to idolatry because we want instant gratification. We want the blessing. We don't want the suffering. We want the benefits, but we don't want to, to, to endure anything. And, and that's how a lot of false prophecy comes in. That's how a idol worship comes in. Uh, it's, you know, we could go on and on with that, but I see this comfort. I think we, we think that this is going to be immediate when it's really not. God is telling us what the end results are going to be. Right. He's right. telling us that's going to come a point in time when this is what's going to exist. But in the interim, there's other things that's going to go on. But if we have that comfort that God is going to do what he says he's going to do, then we have to wait on that manifestation instead of trying to think that we are immune to going through any trials or tribulations because that, that wouldn't even that wouldn't even make sense you just ask god for something like like a genie and you get it no trials no tribulations. think how small we would be how jacked up we'd be we would be you because all we'd be doing is begging god for stuff <laughs> and if you know like somebody get more stuff than i have i'm going to god well god i'm good too i want more stuff than he got <laughs> and you see how that here go on and on and on, and we ain't serving nobody. We want to serve ourselves. So uh, that that's what I see there. That, that as believers, we don't fully understand the complete ramifications of the manifestations of God's comfort. It may be immediate, and it may be years off. <laughs> Amen. And that's part of the problem. We don't like waiting. We don't like waiting. And you see that in, in, in even now, it's even worse because we're in like these times where everything is instant. We want everything fast or everything done quickly. And, you know, it's funny, though, when you were talking about that, it, it reminded me, you know, when you first come to Christ and you obey, how you, when you pray and God, it seems like when you pray, everything happened like that. You get it, just, you know, like that. But then as we grow and we, be, you know, in God and, and we start to mature in God, things take a little bit longer. God don't give it to us as quickly as he did when we um, were babes and how he increases our faith. Right. You know, he increases our faith and, and he so teaches he, us the way. And in the natural, if we have children, when your children are, and of course I'm not a mother, just a father. When your children are newborn, when they cry, we want to feed them. But when they get five, six years old, no, 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 you're not going to get fed right now. We got to cook. You got to wait for the food to cook. Be prepared. We about to go to the store. You see, the the gratification is going to take less time as we, more time as we mature. God's not going to keep feeding us like little babies for the rest of our lives. But yet, oh, yeah. I better stop. A lot of churches want to keep us spiritually as little babies. You go there, you get that little pacifier. The pastor done made you feel good. And you go right back to your hellish lifestyle for the rest of the week. Feel good on Sunday and you're living miserably all the rest of the time. You're living in confusion. Instant gratification is not good for a real believer. You absolutely right. And Amen. then they get a certain age, you tell them, go cook your own food. Go feed yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But that's right. You know, teaching us to wait on God. And even in the waiting, what are we doing? How are we even waiting? That's also important. How we're waiting. 
You know, are we worrying? Why are we waiting? Or, you know, are we getting frustrated? Are we still trying to figure out how to do things ourselves? Are we just praying and trusting God? Are we, or to, are we trying to help him or get ahead right. of God? Yeah, and, the waiting, and, what we do in the waiting is also important. And that script, I think it was Romans 4, it read through it. Uh, yeah. It talked about Abraham. It's about his faith. I don't know where it uh, would have blended in. I don't want to monopolize the lesson. But at the end, I would say to Abraham trusted God and that was counted unto him as righteousness. He was yes. right with God before he was circumcised. He was right with God before he matured because he trusted God without seeing everything God had said he was going to get. Amen. And so that was promise he didn't see. And we don't we don't want to go through that Abrahamic process. Well, some people don't. But that's what we all are in. If Abraham had to do it, we got to do the same thing. Trust with God. And just keep following him, keep doing his way, keep doing that, what we know that he is saying to do. Live the way he say live. Do those things that he say do, the way he said do it. And the, the results is up to God, not us. But that will set us in a right standing with him by doing what he said. Not all Amen. this other superficial nonsense. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Anybody else want to com comment? Anything else uh, that we just covered in 40? Amen. God's comfort. Uh, Sister people. Sylvia. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, I'm not I'm just adding on what the pastor Ed was just saying, but in that verse 31, yes. it, it, it specifically states that those that wait on the Lord... <laughs> So therefore, when we seek and trust in the Lord, then then we are actually waiting on Him, and we're, we're we're looking for things to come from the Lord. We are renewing our strength uh, when we are seeking the Lord only. But if you're just waiting, waiting for what, <laughs> you know? No, the words say those that wait on the Lord. Amen. I want to read it from the Amplified. I want to read that verse, that last verse in um, uh, 40, verse 31, the one that uh, uh, Elder Jones was just referencing. And this reads like this. It said, but those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. Amen. Because, and, 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 and I like how that reads because it's true because every time we see God moves move in our lives, he makes himself even more known to us and it draws us closer to him. It increases our faith. Amen. So uh, we're going to go on to chapter 41 and we're going to go back to the questions next week. Now I'll go back and, and um, look through those, my copy. And um, we're going to go to chapter 41. And I'm going to be reading mostly probably from the Amplified, I think, on this one because I like how it read in some things. But this chapter um, 41 is titled God's Help for Israel. Amen, his help for Israel. And it reads, it says, it says, listen in silence before me, you lands beyond the sea. Bring your strongest arguments. Come now and speak. The court is ready for your case. And um, I want to go to Isaiah 46, 11. Isaiah 46, verse 11. And it says, I will call a swift bird of prey from the east, a leader from a distant land to come and do my bidding. I've said what I, I will do and I will do it. In verse two, it says, who has stirred up this king from the east? Hmm. Yeah, that's what I said. 
who has stirred up this king from the east, rightly calling him to God's service? Who gives this man victory over many nations and permits him to trample their kings underfoot? With his sword, he reduces armies to dust. With his bow, he scatters them like the chaff before the wind. Okay, so I'm gonna stop right there. <clears throat> and I wanna go to Isaiah 45, verse one. Isaiah 45, one reads, this is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. Their fortress gates will be open and never shut again. And then we're going to go to, was that Ezra? Yeah, Ezra. It's Ezra. Because this king that he's talking about raising up from the east is Cyrus. Okay? And we're going to see in what period of time. This is during uh, Ezra. So we're going to go to Ezra 1. Ezra, this, Ezra 1. And it, Ezra 1, two, verses 2 through 3. And it reads, this is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. It says, any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you wherever this remnant is found. Now, isn't that surprising? <laughs> okay let's talk let's let's um i want to I, I wanted to go to um let me read is it king from the east the cyrus the king of persia who actually knew who the true, true and living god was and he was willing to allow ezra they were going to 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 go he was allowing them to go back and rebuild the temple Okay, and if you all want to go back further and read more about that, you can. But I just kind of wanted to um, read a little bit on Cyrus in my um, Bible dictionary. This little gnat got in here some kind of way, plucking my nerves. Cyrus, way up here, Cyrus. Let's kind of get a little background on Cyrus. Okay, Cyrus, the Persian king who permitted the Jews to return from exile in 538 BC. Okay. He was the third king of Anshan, born uh, modern Malian, became king about 5, 5, 559 BC. He was reared by a shepherd after his grandfather, king of Midia. They, he ordered that he be killed and Cyrus organized the Persians into an army. He revolted against his grandfather and father, Cambyses, and defeated them and claimed their throne about 550. Anyway, it says... You can read about King Cyrus's decree in, that occurred in 539 BC in 2 Chronicles. If you want to write this down, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 36, verses 22 to 23 in Ezra, where we just read. He set free the captives of Babylon. The cap, uh, he set free the captive that Babylon had taken during its harsh rule, including the Jews taken from Jerusalem in 586 BC. And they were allowed to return to build the temple and the city. Cyrus restored the valuable treasures of the temple taken during the exile. And many Jews had done well in Babylon financially and did not want to return to the wastes of Judah. 
From these people, Cyrus exacted a tax to help pay for the trip for those who did wish to build Jerusalem. Cyrus publicly worshiped the gods of each kingdom he conquered. Thus, he won the hearts of his subjects and kept down revolt. He is referred to as Yah's shepherd and anointed. And we'll read that later in Isaiah 44. It says Cyrus was killed while fighting um, a frontier war with the nomadic Masjid people. And his tomb is, is, his tomb is in Mergabi. So anyway, this is a little bit on King Cyrus, amen? <clears throat> Which I was really surprised because I'm like, oh, okay, hallelujah. But as God said before, these are he these nations he used as uh, his battle axe to do his will. God used him to destroy many nations and, and, and even um, come against Israel and deal with them during their sinful time. Amen. Back to 41. Okay, and it reads here in verse, I'm gonna go back to two and it says 41 two, who has stirred up this king from the East rightly calling him the God service. Who gives this man victory over many nations and permits him to trample their kings underfoot? With his sword, he reduces armies to dust, and with his bow, he scatters them like chaff before the wind. He, verse 3. He chases them away and goes on safely, though he is walking over unfamiliar ground. Verse 4. Who has done such mighty deeds, summoning each new generation from beginning of time? It is I, the Lord, the first and the last. I alone am he. So the most high is saying here, he summoned him. He has summoned him. Just like he said the same thing about the Prince of Persia. Remember he was saying he, they, Assyria, they're there to do God's work. God uses these nations. Amen. Verse five, it says the land beyond the sea, Watch in fear, remote lands tremble and mobilize for war. The idol makers encourage one another, saying to each other, be strong. And the carver encourages the goldsmith and the molder. And the molder helps at the anvil. God, good, they say, it's coming along fine. And carefully they join their parts together and they fasten the things in place so it won't fall over. But as you see, Israel, my servant, Jacob, my chosen one, descended from Abraham, my friend. I've called you back from the ends of the earth, saying you are my servant, for I have chosen you. Amen. Don't be afraid, for I'm with you. And don't be discouraged, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Um, let's see here. I wanted to read, I think it was Hebrews, Hebrews 2. Man, it was a on my nerve. It was Hebrews. Yeah. Hebrews 2.16, I believe it was. Hebrews 2.16. Hebrews 2.16, James 2. No. James 2.23. And this was, um, you write this one down, James 2.23. This was the one I think Pastor Ed referenced. It was, and it reads, and it says, so the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed and adhered, trusted to, and relied on God. And this was accounted to him as righteousness, as conformity to God's will in, th in thought and deed. And he was called God's friend. And that's just what we read in Isaiah 41, verse 8. And I want to stop here because I don't want to go further in. We're already at 8 o'clock. 
because I have a lot of verses and other um, reference scriptures to apply to 41. And I really don't want to go further into it. So this is right on time. We can stop. And I can't believe it's already eight o'clock. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. You all were very quiet tonight. I thank everyone all you for your participation. <laughs> Everybody is quiet and solemn tonight. Praise God. Amen. But God is good and we thank him. He's faithful and he is true. And um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to close in prayer. Amen. Praise God. Father God, we thank you. Father God, we thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come and sit and sup at your table. Oh God, we thank you, almighty Yah. We ask, Father God, that Father God, continue to cover and keep us, oh God, as only you can. Our hope and our trust is in you and you alone, not man. Father God, but you almighty Yah. Father God, if we pray and ask, Father God, that you will continue to encamp your angels round about us, protecting us and keeping us and our families, oh God. And everyone who is listening tonight, every member of Kingdom Covenant Ministries, that they will keep us, lifting us up, Father God. They will bear us in their arms. At least we should even dash our feet against a stone. According to your word in Psalms 91, oh God, we ask almighty Yah. Father God, that you protect us from the noisome pestilence, Father God, and the disease, and that you won't allow it to come nigh us, nor the places we dwell, O oh God. We ask Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, that you continue to keep us, Father God, from every evil, wicked scheme that the enemy has devised against us, O oh God. Father God, we pray, Father God, that every scheme, Father God, you turn it on his own head, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. Father God, no weapon, no weapon devised against us. Father God, we ask that you don't allow it to prosper against us. Father God, and every tongue that would rise against us, the judges, we ask that you would condemn. In the name of Jesus, Father God, we ask that you continue to lead us and guide us on the path of righteousness for your name's sake, oh God. And we thank you, Father God, for being the lift of our heads. That, Father God, in times of trouble, we can look to you, oh God. Father God, you from whence cometh our help, our help comes from you, Father God. And we thank you that you are the one that keeps us. You are our keeper, none other but thee. So we trust you, oh God. And we thank you, Father God, for keeping us as only you can. We thank you for the very breath that you breathe in our lungs, oh God, the air that we intake, oh God. We thank you. Thank you, Father God. Father God, so we say, Father God, continue to order our steps, oh God. And we thank you, oh God. In Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah's name, we pray. Amen.